So speaking of guavas, Ooh. would you like to try Ooh. one? I have never, I've never had guava. Now you I can eat them think. with or without the skin. Uh, mm. People, mm. I have, I prefer without, but mm. kind of tropical, Look, juicy lowly. fruit sort it's of. Very um, perfumey, fragrant. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, I think I'll, I'll, have I'll one take myself. more. Thanks. Yeah. Here, dig in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. You know, so, by the way, people don't think of containers. This is actually an aquatic pot that I brought back from Thailand. Uh, it was a little hard to fit in the overhead luggage compartment. <laughs> but, um, I bet it was. This is peak moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. We're in suburban Santa Barbara and I'm here with a landscape architect and educator named Owen Dell. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure. And author of a book on home-based landscape architecting, right? Yes, right. Well, Owen, I want to know, here we are in your neighborhood, typical Americana suburbs. What is it that you, as a landscape architect, see here or see missing? Well, this is pretty typical. You've got uh, front lawns and picket fences, and it's kind of the American dream of the 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still here after these, all these many years. Yeah. These houses were built in the 50s, and uh, it was an interesting time in history because people and our culture was moving from an agrarian base to a more urban base and the whole suburb uh, phenomenon came about partly because people wanted to go back to having a little land. A little bit of nature. And doing something with it. Yeah, yeah. And that came from the fact that probably many of those people, maybe most of those people, had someone in their family mm. who was in farming, mm. Mm. Um, okay. maybe their parents even. And so they had this connection with land that we don't have 50 years hence. Mm. But then something got perverted, you know, and we ended up with uh, lawns and junipers and ornamental plants, which are fine up to a point, but they don't really do very much in terms of productivity when you think about agriculture versus ornamental plants. So the agrarian picture is one in which you've got productive landscapes. Is that what, is that part exactly. of that picture? Exactly. Aha, uh -huh. orchards and farming and gardens and, and chickens sort of and all uh -huh. of the elements okay. of a tiny, tiny farm. That's what these houses were really based upon, maybe subconsciously, but the idea that everyone could have a little bit of land with yes. a house on yes. it. And oftentimes they're built on the best farmland mm. uh, in the world. And this is a pretty good case of that. We have excellent soils here. And then somehow it all got twisted around and we ended up growing lawns instead of food or, or native plants that are habitat for the okay. native animals or something that matters. And it doesn't mean that the ornamental aspect of landscape is all bad. There is a place for that, mm -hmm. a place for the kids mm -hmm. to play. And you know, it's just beauty. Beauty is very important. But we lost something very, very critical and so that's one issue. And then the other issue is, of course, all the inputs of resources that go into maintaining something like this. Because you're looking at, what, chemicals on the lawns Potentially, often, or chemicals, water, yes, um, yes. fossil fuel use is tremendous. Uh, the mowing, the, the hauling of things in and out, ah, and then all ah. the waste stream, all the outputs. So you look at what goes into the landscape, what comes uh -huh, out of the okay. landscape. And it's okay to have inputs and outputs if you're getting something valuable out of it, whether it's native habitat, uh, or food or something okay. else. Okay. But so many of our landscapes, I would say most of our ornamental landscapes in this country, produce nothing. Other than the beauty and the space and that's it. And dubious beauty in most cases. I would, I would, agree. You know, I would agree. We're not talking about works of art here in, yeah. in, in many cases. We're talking about places that are fairly humble. Um, so how might we take and transform this um, certainly people are thinking, thinking ahead now towards having more of our food locally um, and, and other resources. I mean, there's a lot of rain that must fall on mm -hmm. this that just Absolutely. sits here. So I think it'd be real interesting. What, what might we do to transform this? Exactly. Well, it, that's such an important question because I really think 
that the, um, the suburbs, uh, in addition to the fact that they are in many ways dreadful, are also the richest place in terms of potential for something good to happen. Because we have a house with land all around it. And this model is repeated millions of times yes. throughout yes. the country and actually around the world now. Mm. Each side of the house has a slightly different microclimate, which means it's good for a little bit different kind of production. Uh, fruit trees, vegetable gardens, uh, whatever it is. Um, we have good soil, we have sun falling on it, which mm -hmm. is free, we have rain falling on it, which we can harvest, which is free. Mm -hmm. And we have the potential to turn not only each individual home, but entire neighborhoods into highly functioning, food-bearing, and native habitat systems that work both as a natural system and as a self-contained, or partly self-contained, food-growing system for the neighborhood. A neighborhood? I mean, this, a real is, this is an interesting idea. Now, how would you take a neighborhood like this? We've got fences between each parcel. Mm -hmm. How do you? How would you transform this? Is it the project you guys have in mind? Yeah. Somewhere? Well, you know, the fence yeah. thing is interesting because in the Midwest they don't have fences. Uh -huh. And if you put up a fence, you're considered very strange. And here, if you took down a fence, fence you'd, they'd you probably call the police. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, which is bizarre. But that's just a different cultural thing. But in e either case, the neighborhoods are basically the same thing. So, how would you, you know, just in short, in, in brief, mm -hmm. what might you do to take a neighborhood to transform that, okay. not just individual? Well, um, the first thing that that I would look at is, as we do in in any design problem, is what's here, what's here now. What do we have? Okay. Um, and if we're looking at it from the standpoint of food production, then what are, what are we growing that's edible? Um, and a lot of things aren't even obvious. For example, I'm looking at this hedge over here, which is Australian brush cherry. Okay. It's a tree that gets about 100 feet tall in nature. And of course, wow. we're keeping it to an eight foot tall hedge here, which is a ridiculous use of it's a plant. A All right. But it does produce a marginally edible fruit. All right. And it requires really almost no care other than the trimming. And um, it's an example of a kind of stealth food source that's already here. And then you have the more obvious things like apple trees, avocado trees, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, whatever mm -hmm, it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Without really doing much, you've already got a lot of food that you can go and glean. So that's number one. Walk the neighborhood, talk to people, find out what's here, find out what's available, and begin to make use of it. And then there's a second stage, and that's beginning to tune the neighborhood for food production. Ah. And the way that works, is, as I see it, is this. We choose um, particular appropriate plants for each property. Nobody has to grow everything on their property. You do not have to be self-sufficient within yourself like a survivalist, you okay. know, where you, you, you block everything off this, and you the walls put are here gun, and I gun turrets up yeah. on the thing and you keep the <laughs> hordes out yes. and you grow yes. everything and you make all your own everything. Right. That's not the model. Okay. Because you're missing, first of all, it's very hard to do. It's really impossible to do. And secondly, you're missing all the social benefits of community. Right, right. One of the problems with suburbia is that the community aspect is really, really hard to get going because people push the button, drive into the garage, close the door, go into the house, and, and they don't even get to know each ourselves. other. And you can live yeah. across the street from someone for 25 years and never get to know them. Right. Okay. If everybody has a part in the food growing system, well, So the second phase of this whole thing is to then begin to plug in elements of the edible landscape necessary to create a balanced diet for the neighborhood so that we share the system, the food growing system throughout the neighborhood. All sorts of benefits arise from that. Number one, you can't grow everything on your little lot around your house. It simply doesn't work. Number two, even if it did, you have to know everything about everything in order to be successful at that. You have to know how to grow broccoli, peaches, one. apricots, you know, Nuts, chickens, and very few people are capable of that yeah. or are interested. Right. Um, number three, it brings people together as a social ah. system. And so now you start to have ancillary benefits that actually are core to the whole thing, which is about people. Because people we can go buy our groceries somewhere. And sharing the food exactly. or preserving together or S knowledge. Little food swaps on Saturday mornings. Um, yeah, sharing information about problems with growing, 
the recipes. Neighborhood, the neighborhood then, compost pile or something. Yeah, and then you begin to share resources ah. as well. And it starts to get really fun. And even people who weren't particularly interested in growing food or thought they couldn't do it, all of a sudden find themselves involved with this process. I can imagine that people find their own place, right? I mean, somebody yeah. who's really interested in tinkering can do the little irrigation and whatever, and somebody else who likes exactly. canning can, you know, that everybody finds, can exactly. find something they enjoy. Exactly. And some people won't want to be involved. That's fine. We can ask if we can use their land. Say, hey, listen, can we plant a fruit tree over in the corner here? It looks a little barren. Anyway. And we'll water Wouldn't that be it. Nice? And we'll water it, and then you'll get some of the plums or whatever it is. Fun. So what we're trying to do is develop this in a test neighborhood here, okay. um, right in this neighborhood, and get some people together and begin to see how that works. I call it the managed suburban food shed. The managed so, suburban food little, shed. My little moniker for it. Sounds pretty official. It. Yeah, I mean, it sounds good. <laughs> the basic idea is let's grow some food, eat it, and maybe have a party and have some fun because it's got to be fun too. For the long term. That's yeah. great. I like this. Let's take a look at some of what you've done just in your own, in your own little pot and okay. neighbors perhaps that moves in that direction that can give us an idea of what we could visualize that would be different. Okay? Sounds good. Let's go. So, Owen, here at your house, I noticed it's very different from the rest of the neighbors. The first thing I noticed was, what, grasshopper? Nope, lacewing. Lacewing. It's a beneficial insect. Yeah? Yeah, it, it eats junk mail. I want one. Yeah, I love they're it. Very handy. <laughs> so, what else is here in your front yard that um, would be an example of what you do for a, transforming a lot? Yeah, well, a lot of the things here are, are simply ornamentals. They're native plants, and there's kind of a desert feel to it. But within that, you have the big cactus plant. The beaver mm. tail or opuntia and it has two sources of food on it one is the beautiful ripening fruit Pretty. that you see there uh, you they're delicious you have to peel them first because they're a little bit uh, spiny for most <laughs> tastes unless you like really zippy foods and uh, then the pads when they're young are cooked down of course as uh, the leaf like yes yeah, the uh -huh. tunas i believe they call them in the mexican culture and um, the neat thing is this requires no water it's a desert plant it requires absolutely no care I planted it, uh, you know, 15 years ago, and I've done zero of anything to it. Wonderful. So that's pretty nice. And then behind it, I've got a new macadamia tree, which is uh, sort of the other end of the spectrum in terms of being a tropical yeah. tree. And of course, who doesn't love macadamia nuts? And it's going to start to produce probably next year, and it'll just shower this whole front yard with How uh, tall will this get? Get about 20 feet tall eventually. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. All right. Really nice to come out and pick your own macadamias. I uh, will visit you in a few years to Please just do. check that out. Please do. What else do you have in your lot? That... Well, come on in. This is just the beginning. Okay. Here. So welcome to my world. It's beautiful. There's just so much going on here. It's just amazing. Yeah, there is a lot going on. I, I recently inventoried the edible, useful, and ornamental plants on this property, which is a 7,500-square-foot lot, and it's mm -hmm. got buildings taking up more than half of that space. Right. So it's not a lot of room. There are over 120, 129 varieties. Useful, edible, edible ornamental, medi or useful, edible, and medicinal, medicinal plants. Like this rosemary. Which rosemary, which has all sorts oh. of uses mm -hmm. aside from mm -hmm. all the great culinary uses. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a great one. Um, a tangerine tree back here. Oh. We, you know, people in other climates are so envious of us because you. we can walk out and pick navel oranges and grapefruits and all kinds of things whenever all the citrus, we want. All so. the citrus. And there's some herbs around that. Um, we've got a, um, another great Mediterranean climate plant here is the artichoke. Mm. And um, this is so easy, it's just a weed. And actually one of the key things that I've found is find plants that are weed-like but not troublesome that pretty much take care of themselves. And I've been really surprised to find how many of those are. And uh -huh. I'll show you a couple uh -huh. more of them as we go through. The artichoke sits here, it's a thistle, it's a tough plant. And uh, at least once a year, sometimes two or three times a year, you get a huge crop of artichokes, oh, which of course everybody Divine. loves those. It's a good excuse for eating mayonnaise, basically. But <laughs> um, delicious stuff. And kind of a pretty plant. Behind it, uh, citrus. I think this is a bear slime. And then I've got a bunch of young citrus around here. Here's a really neat one that you may know if you're into Thai cooking. I am. Kaffir lime leaf. Kaffir lime leaf. Yeah. It smells That's great. a really nice fragrance. Slice that to, up, to... throw it in your curry, and it brings it totally alive. Yep. And an easy plant to grow. Again, I don't do anything to this. It's very young. It'll get up this high oh. and uh, take care of itself. And I've got four or five more different citrus back here. And way back in the background, I don't know if you can see it, is a mango tree. I don't think we're going to get hot enough 
to actually here. produce mangoes. But um, this one but here that's is a really mango? pretty. Is that a mango? Yep. Uh -huh. And I love mangoes and I love the tree. And whether it ever produces or not, I don't know. You're we'll just see. happy just because it's here. I'm happy because right. it's here and right. whatever. There's some berries in here. Of course, the roses rose, make rose, rose hips. Rose hips. I was going to say, rose you're tea. full of rose hips here. Uh, various kinds of ginger, some of which are edible. What else do we have here? Um, there's so many things. Sorrel. Um, sorrel is, soup. What, what do you do with sorrel? You pick it. It's kind of it lemony, well. and uh, you can make soup out of it. It's, um, uh, it's a very kind of zesty mm. thing. Yeah, yeah. And Pens that's cool. And of course, nasturtiums, um, which they're not in bloom right now, but the flowers, uh, the flowers um, okay. are great in, in salads and things. And here's actually one that I've really had a lot of fun with. That's a potato. Yeah. And I planted potatoes once, and I've never planted potatoes since, and I keep getting potatoes. There's more over there. Oh, they're all over the place. You know, there's potatoes everywhere here. So that's one of those easy, easy to grow. Well, when you, I mean, it's a, a weed. It's almost a weed. When you pick the potatoes, you leave those little bitty potatoes, and they, guess what they do? They turn into potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Big potatoes, and then you pick those, and the same thing keeps happening. Once you plant potatoes, you've got them forever. That's the kind of food forest plant that really works And that's so what's well. appealing to people who do not necessarily want to spend a lot of time cultivating. Yeah, see, there's a myth that, that food growing is really hard. And it's a lot of hard work. And it is if you want to turn the soil over and everything. I, I never turn the soil over. You can see that I mulch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's not real mm -hmm, pretty mulch mm -hmm. because it's all the stuff that comes out of the garden cut up into little bitty pieces and just spread back down where the nutrients need to go, right back into the soil to nurture mm -hmm. the next generation of that plant. Mm -hmm. And so I stand here with my pruning shears and I clip, clip, clip everything up and, and it let just it fall. Stays. They call them leaves because you're supposed to leave them there. <laughs> so, <laughs> technical I like term. that. Um, what is this gorgeous, gorgeous magenta plant? That's amaranth and that showed up oh. voluntarily. I have no idea where it Serious? came from. Serious? Yep. Amaranth is a, is a grain, right? A seed. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm um, waiting for it to do its thing. I think it's an edible variety, but I don't actually know. It's beautiful. We'll find out. Beautiful. So I want to know what's the ladder, the permanent looking ladder there on the side of your, of oh, your yes. house. Oh, yes. Well, that's an interesting story. Okay. Um, one of the places you can grow food is up on the roof. Really? Yep. Okay. And so, of course, there's a whole movement of the eco-roof movement where they're planting sedums and other things on roofs to absorb the rainwater yes, and absorb yes. the toxins and everything. But the other direction that you can take roof gardening is to grow food, what they call an intensive eco-roof or green roof. And you can actually grow food up there. Now, what you've just looked at is down low, it's kind of in the shade, particularly this time of yeah. year yeah. when the sun is low in the sky. And so it's problematic to grow certain things. And our neighborhood is not real warm. It's right on the ocean, where the ocean's a block away. Mm -hmm. And we have trouble growing heat-loving things like tomatoes and eggplants wow. and whatnot. So the answer is put them up on the roof where they get some sun. OK. You want to see? Sure. OK, no falling off the roof allowed. Okay. That's a rule. <laughs> oh, what fun. Tubs. These are. Um, Mortar mixing trays from the stone yard place. Mm. They were seven dollars a piece, and they got some potting soil in them, which I inoculated with mycorrhizal fungus, which is a living fungus that's symbiotic on the roots of plants and helps them to absorb moisture and moisture and nutrients. Okay. And um, I just replanted this, so it's not too showy right now. But I've grown tomatoes up here. I've grown sage, lettuce, cilantro, broccoli, uh, chives. Um, Peppers? Ginger, got, peppers of all kinds, chilies, right? different kinds of chilies, beets, you name it, other than maybe carrots. They're a little shallow for carrots. Uh, beets? So, yeah, you I'm trying beets. This uh -huh. is a first for uh -huh. beets. Yeah. And they take um, more frequent watering. Obviously, it's hotter, <laughs> windier, and it dries out, and there's not much soil there right. to start out with. So you, but, just do, uh, you just come and hand water? I hand water, and I've got this uh, nice little hose. and. The ladder actually acts as a pipe with a hose bib built into it so Great. that uh, I That's get water up fun. here. It's That's very convenient. Fun. And it's different, but it's working very well because we get a lot more heat units up here than we do down, down below. And it would probably extend your season some. Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm still experimenting with this. This is just the last couple of years I've been doing this. So I'm learning what works better up here. And um, 
what works at different times of the year mm -hmm. and how far mm -hmm. I can push the limits of all this. So it's, it's a big experiment, but it's kind of fun. I can just see it now saying to your neighbors in your, in your project, it's like, well, you may not want to use your land, but can we use your roof? Exactly, exactly. And why not? Look at how many roofs Gosh. there are. I would expect that it's also the roofs are a major source for your rainwater. Well, the other thing the that a roof does is, a, is it is part of the watershed. The watershed begins right at the peak of every roof. Right. And we have the capacity to collect water off these roofs and use it in the garden. Is, and why not do it? I mean, it's already going down into the garden anyway, so you might as well channel it to where you want it to Exactly. Be. I mean, we've treated rainwater as waste for so long, and now we're starting to see it as a resource, which it has always been. Sure. And it's funny because the whole culture talks about, like, the threat of rain. You know, you hear the I threat know. of rain. Why is rain a threat? The Unless it's going to, you know, like, wash you out to sea, it's not a threat. It's a good thing. Yeah, or bad weather. What is bad weather? Right. Well, especially here, we don't have bad weather. <laughs> Maybe every 10 years we have a little bad weather, but uh, we don't know what bad weather is. No, not so and far. rain is pretty much always a good thing. What's this lovely, lovely tree? Oh, this is one of my favorite plants. This is... Uh, one of the most sustainable plants for our region. And what's important to know is that every area has plants that are optimal for that area. This wouldn't be good in Nebraska, but it's great here. It's pineapple guava or fajoa, and it's a Mediterranean plant. It's drought tolerant. It gets absolutely no pests, and it produces uh, abundant quantities of delicious, fragrant guavas, which taste like juicy fruit gum, very tropical flavor. Uh, they fall on the ground, so you don't have to pick them. You just pick them up, and it doesn't get any easier than this. That's, so. that's paradise. And it's free. You know, that's the other thing about it. You buy a plant, you let it grow. It's a perennial plant. It'll be here for 50 years or more, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it doesn't cost a plug nickel to get a lot of fruit off of it. Fresh, organic, no transport cost, uh, no, no fossil energy involved and you can share them with your friends and your neighbors, and that's the idea. I, I can imagine that that's the culminating idea, really, for your, your food shed. Exactly. Is as many of these as possible, abundance. shared abundance, and people with different things in different little places, so that somebody's got the chicken, so you can all have eggs. And exactly. And if there's a bunch of eggs, then uh, so much the better. Or if somebody's got a lot of lemons, then you call everybody and say, hey, it's lemon time, yep, yep, yep. you know, get ready to make those pies or lemonade Maybe. or whatever it is. And it's always changing and it's always local. And everybody gets to have a really neat conversation about food. And they get to know each other in a way that suburbs, the suburbs have not really fostered in the past. They've fostered isolation, social isolation. And this is a way to bring people together in a really fun way have a party, take the food and cook it and all share, I eating in the middle of the street or whatever sounds, you want to do. I mean, yeah, close the street off and party. Have a good time. Yep. Meet each other. Exactly. I love it. It's a great vision. I hope that it really, I really hope that your seed idea blossoms here in your neighborhood. Not to make a pun or anything. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and thank you. This has been wonderful. My pleasure. You're watching Peak Moment. Community responses to a changing energy future. I'm Janea Donaldson and I'm up on the roof in Santa Barbara. This is a peak moment. Join us again. So a lot of people don't think about containers. Um, this is actually a pot I brought back from Thailand. It's a little hard to fit in the overhead luggage compartment, but uh, <laughs> oh, I got no. some dirty looks. But um, it made it Serious? back. Serious? You tried and, this uh, No, I actually had it shipped with some <laughs> other ceramics, but um, it's a beautiful pot. Mm. And it's filled with water, and these are water hyacinths, which um, absorb uh, pollutants and whatnot, of course. But yeah. this little plant here, not much to look at, but it's um, a uh, water chestnut. And you can actually grow water chestnuts. Really? And they're, if you've ever had a fresh water chestnut, they're nothing like those little pallid things in the I've, can. I've heard that. Absolutely delicious. So you're war it's a warm enough climate to be able to do water yeah. chestnuts. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. what a treat. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to harvesting on that. Really this keeps nice. the raccoons out, by the way. Oh, that's, that's good. I, yeah, that would be great. I love this. This is wonderful. I mean, you've got it on the roof. You've got it in the pots. You've got it on the ground. You've got things that are volunteers. You make it look easy. It actually is pretty easy. Thank you. Yeah. You inspire the rest of us. Anybody can do our this. Thumbs are green. And you don't even have to work that hard. I'm kind of a lazy guy and uh, I pull it off. So. Doesn't look it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. This is a great tour. Have another guava. I'll take oxen. This is so good. <laughs>